Roughly this time last year, we spent an extended period of time taking a look at logic components. While we went to great depths looking at individual components and understanding how they worked, we never really thought about you know, how to move things one level up, and that is how these components would come together to actually make the processor in your computer. Today, we're going to move that one step up to take a look at what is known as an instruction set architecture, or ISA for short. We're going to try and understand the purpose as well as the implementation of an instruction set, and we'll try and see why it's necessary. We've got a long episode ahead of us, so without further ado, let us jump right in after the break. <laughs> So, instruction sets. First of all, why do we even need them? What is their purpose? You see, here's the deal. When you are programming for a computer, you would probably not like to write your program entirely in terms of the language of logic. That is, your program can only consist of things like and, or, and not. You know, that would be very inconvenient, not to mention very hard to read. Instead, we're trying to express our programs in a manner that is easier to understand, at a higher level that basically allows us to step away from the logic implementation. Throughout the logic component series, you would have seen an adder. Of course, it will be easy to refer to it as simply, you know, a component that does addition, as opposed to having to think of it in terms of its individual components. The concept is exactly the same, and it is that of abstraction. Most ISAs allow you to work with a CPU as well as its components using simple instructions. These instructions are simply bit strings, and inside them we encode several crucial pieces of information. Each instruction must contain an opcode, and this opcode basically tells the CPU what exactly you're trying to execute. Apart from the opcode, the rest of the instruction contains information about basically what the instruction is supposed to work on. So you can point it towards registers, you can give it values for it to work on, you know, things like that. This instruction is then passed off to some part of the CPU, which translates it. It will probably look at the opcode and try to figure out what it is you want to do, and then it will fire off the necessary component to do the job. At this point here is an interesting fact that is worth pointing out. The instruction itself doesn't actually say anything about, you know, which components are in charge of doing what. The implementation is separate from the instruction. So, in fact, when you have, say, an Intel processor versus an AMD processor, they can both implement the x86 instruction set. What this means is both these processors understand the same instructions. However, their implementation, that is, the actual logic circuits laid out on the CPU, can be completely different. It doesn't matter as long as at the end of the day, it understands the same instructions and it gives you the same results. And that right there is one level of abstraction. You're basically separating the instructions from the implementation. As long as the instruction is translated correctly, well, things will work as you'd expect. So what we've done so far is we've looked at ISAs as well as the individual instructions. We almost know enough to actually look at some examples of an ISA in action. But not just yet, I do have to fill you in on two little things. First and foremost is how code is actually stored. You see, every instruction is a bit string, and what this means is it simply occupies some space in memory. And if you have multiple instructions, which most programs do, what you can do is you can just line up these instructions in consecutive areas of memory. You can imagine each one of these pigeonholes to have an address. And this address is extremely important because that is what we're going to be using to basically refer to the individual instructions. We need to know where the instructions are and that will help us to actually jump back and forth if we ever need to do so. So that's one of the two concepts. The other is the concept of a register. You see, when your CPU is working, even with just an individual instruction, it may need to temporarily hold some information in some places. A register helps it do just that. Registers are basically very small amounts of memory, 
normally they just hold one number or one address and if any calculations or any instructions are made then the register value could be used or changed. So yeah, think of a register as just a temporary holding area for one number or one address. All right, having come this far, it is now time to actually look at several example instructions. For this purpose, we'll look at the MIPS ISA. It's not an extremely common use, but its relative simplicity makes it a good educational tool. I used it in school myself, and it wasn't very hard to pick up. MIPS instructions are 32 bits in length, and there are three different instruction types. What this means is, there are actually three different ways in which we can divide up the 32 bits. They are known as the R, I, and J type instructions. We'll look at this in greater detail over several examples. All you need to take note of at this point is the fact that the first six bits always refers to the opcode. That is in fact how MIPS knows how to tell apart the different types of instructions. Different opcodes are associated with different instruction types. So MIPS just needs to look at the opcode and it'll know whether that instruction is an R type, I type or J type. So knowing that, let us move on to the first type of instruction, and that is the J type instruction. Now, J type instructions are the simplest. They're simply jumps and the first six bits refer to the opcode. The remaining 26 bits simply specify the address in which you jump to. So nothing very complicated, Let's step it up a little with our second example, which looks at the I-type. The I-type basically stands for instructions containing an immediate value. To understand what this means, let us take a look at an example. This is the add immediate instruction. Of course, as usual, the first six bits are the opcode, and this opcode tells MIPS you want to perform the add immediate instruction. The next five bits actually specify a source register. So this is where the concept of registers come in. When we reference a register like this in MIPS, what we're saying is we want to use the value contained within that register. The next five bits refer to the target register. And what this means is after you've performed the addition, you want to write the answer or the result of the operation to that target register. The remaining 16 bits basically is the amounts you want to add to that particular register. So what this means is this instruction in general basically says take the value from the source register, add this value to it, and write the answer to the target register. And that is the add immediate instruction. So this should make the definition of the term immediate quite clear. You have an immediate value here. It doesn't refer to any register. You just want to use the number here verbatim for our calculation. And that is what MIPS defines as immediate. So that is an I-type instruction. Still pretty straightforward as long as you know where to break down you know, the individual bits and you know what they mean. Well, you'll be able to understand what the operation is trying to do. Next up is the R-type instruction. In the interest of time, we will not be taking a very in-depth look at this. I just want to draw your attention to a pretty neat trick used by MIPS and potentially other ISAs as well. Opcodes in MIPS are 6 bits. What this means is, MIPS can cater for 2 to the power of 6 or 64 instructions. Now, what if you need more instructions? Adding more bits to the opcode may not be the best solution. For example, if we were to make all instructions in MIPS take on 7 bit opcodes, we will have to sacrifice one bit in the add immediate instruction, limiting the extent of our addition. Instead, the ingenious workaround to this is to add a set of function bits to all the R-type instructions. In fact, all R-type instructions have the same opcode. However, the function bits at the end change to reflect the different type of operation requested. This increases the maximum number of MIPS instructions from 64 to 127. And there you have it. Basically, we've taken a very close look both at the concepts of an ISA as well as an implementation of an ISA and what can be done to make it, you know, basically work and some tricks in which you can actually make it do more. Now, here's some further information to make your understanding even more complete. 
First and foremost, of course, writing instructions like this is still not a very good way of you know, coding in general. I mean, you're gonna have to figure out the instructions, you're gonna have to write out actual bit strings, and that's gonna be very tedious and very easy to get wrong. That is why we have what is known as assembly language. Instead of writing out the individual instructions, you know, specifying the opcodes, specifying all the registers, you can also write assembly language. For example, instead of looking up the bit string that is basically the opcode for the add immediate instruction, you can simply write add i. You can then specify the target and destination registers in a friendly manner, as well as the immediate value. When you actually compile your assembly language program, all the compiler needs to do is to understand that instruction and convert it to a bit string. It also needs to understand all the registers, all the immediate values you've specified, and convert those to bit strings as well. So in this case, it is basically a one-to-one -one mapping. You just translate whatever there is there into a series of bit strings. And these can then be executed by a MIPS compliant processor. That's of course far more intuitive than writing bit strings. But that is still not very intuitive. And that is why we have programming languages which are even higher level abstractions of an assembly language. When you write code in a language like C or C++, they're actually compiled to an intermediate assembly language state. That assembly language state is then compiled again down to machine code. So in fact, the levels of abstraction are the levels of compilation as well. Of course, these aren't MIPS instructions. Because I've compiled them on my own computer, they are actually x86 instructions. Of course, this gets compiled further into actual bit strings. Of course, if we were to open that, we wouldn't be able to understand that because, well, it's machine code. These are in fact the bit strings that are pushed directly to the processor, and the processor can then execute these bit strings. And there you have it, that is the concept of ISAs, and we've also taken a look at how abstraction helps us in this particular regard. And that basically wraps up this topic. Of course, this video ran a little long. It's hard to, you know, describe all these things without going into the in-depth examples. But I really hope you've gained some insights in this particular episode. But yeah, that's all I have to tell you about ISAs. Hopefully, I've made things clear. If you have any queries, of course, feel free to leave a comment. But that's it. Thank you very much for watching. You're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.